Welcome to Baltic World. I'm Charlene. I'm Crispin. Our week in review, Baltic World, a channel where we discuss important issues facing Northern, Central and Eastern Europe. Before we begin, where the hell are we, Crispin? We are obviously outdoors. <laughs> uh, we are still planning the trip for the Baltic coming yes. up in April. That is still happening despite the dramas, of course, that are happening in that region. We are testing out ex like external filming, trying to make sure we can line the gimbals up and make sure all our on the road gear is working properly. So we're testing this out right now, obviously. So we're outside, we're gonna do this week in review using external filming equipment and hopefully the quality is enough that uh, it doesn't compromise too much on the studio. That way when we're yeah. on the road in the Baltic, we'll be able to upload episodes on location mm -hmm. and share it with the rest of the world. Yeah, I know this will be good enough if you see it, <laughs> pretty much. But anyway, how are you, Crispin? What's the new? Well, obviously the big thing that's happening in the world is the enormous crisis unfolding in Ukraine. We'll yeah. definitely talk about that today. Mm. That has been absorbing me. I, the best thing that I feel I can do is uh, I get a lot of information sources. It's easy for me to collate them yeah. and then do a report kind of on a daily basis. It takes many, many hours to upload a video each day. So I just wish I could do more. Hopefully mm. I can get you know one up each day. Uh, the, Ukrainians are putting up a valiant defense much greater than I think anyone thought possible mm. uh, and so that's occupying pretty much all of my yeah. spare time. I found it really difficult actually to I guess find a new so it's good that you're doing like you know um, a summary for each day mm. but on Twitter is that where your main news sources are coming from like certain people? Uh, well many sources so twitter of course is yeah. one of them because people easily live tweet out mm. um, i do have contacts in various agencies in the us and britain yeah. uh, in various eu countries and people are constantly sharing information with me people are, are sending me messages on telegram and whatnot because of the um, uh, fact that they see that i'm releasing these videos mm. in quick succession uh, they tend to provide me real-time information so i am getting kind of good sources good material not everything I put out can be 100% verified in the time that I do it, just because yeah. of the time frames. But so far, everything seems to have checked out. Yeah, okay. No, nice. Oh, I'm so excited for our, playing our trip. <laughs> yeah, there are positive things still going on in the world. And one of them is our trip. Yeah. Exactly. And you were saying just how like the flight paths have obviously changed and then just gone around Ukraine. So we're definitely going to Lithuania. Um, that, that's right. So we were going to go... Um, well, we are going from uh, Australia to the, to the Middle East and from mm. the Middle East to Europe. Now, that flight path going to Northern Europe from the Middle East goes right through Crimea, <laughs> Ukraine, Belarus, but all the planes have been diverted uh, are out of that airspace. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it will take us an extra couple of hours to get there. That is, you know, the smallest possible inconvenience given what's going on mm. there. Uh, but, yeah, we are very much looking forward to it. The, the start of April... Mm. We'll be in uh, the Nordic countries and then from there, hopefully coming all the way down through Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, uh, and then possibly Romania as well if we have time. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we'll get tons of footage and meet some of you guys, yeah. um, particularly people that support us on Patreon. We'll be keen to, to meet face to face. And uh, yeah, looking forward to showing Charlene that part of the world where uh, she yeah. can have all the food and the history and oh the museums gosh, yes. and the landscapes. We've got our itinerary kind of mapped out. Perhaps we could share that as well. Yeah, we'll do our best. Um, we're well, still will change. <laughs> yeah, we just um, because the, we know where we're starting, we know where we're finishing. The bits in the middle are unclear. Yeah. But basically, we're landing in Sweden. Uh, we'll just spend a couple of days there, get our bearings, then go straight to Estonia. Mm. Uh, from Estonia, we go down to uh, Latvia, then to Lithuania, then to Poland, then to Hungary, just from just Budapest and Hungary, and then maybe through uh, Romania. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time is going to be in the Baltic countries. So the, the vast majority of the time will be in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania getting as much footage uh, on hand as possible. We want a lot of B-roll for the channel. So we yeah. can, when we're talking about these countries, uh, we can just use our own footage. We don't have to buy stock footage or anything like that. Mm. Uh, and then going to all the different sites that we wouldn't normally get to. Just and you so see that castle, Crispin. <laughs> there are a lot of castles we got to see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Um, I think she's talking about tracky. Which yeah, tracky. Um, puzzle. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, every potato dish on this under the sun. <laughs> the no. cuisine is very different. So people have yeah. a perception of Australian food. It's all Chinese food in Australia. It very much is. <laughs> uh, once upon a time, we had kind of a British cuisine, you know, English yeah. breakfast, that sort of thing. Now it's all, mm. you know, fusion foods, a combination of, you know, Japanese and Indian, Chinese and, mm. and Thai. Uh, and so we have a very Asian way of eating. Yeah. Australians can all eat with chopsticks. It's just a perfectly normal way to eat. Um, knives and forks are increasingly rare. Uh, but uh, yeah mm. no sure so before we touch on ukraine um in our comments some people have been discussing the origins of the Rus. Mm. yeah so there seems to be i guess uh attention to understanding you know were they vikings or were they actually lithuanian like yeah yeah it's a great question i saw this debate so the origins of the Rus. Now, some people on the channel have claimed that the the Rus, the Kievan Rus, those that colonized Novgorod are actually Lithuanians or all Prussians. And yeah. that is regrettably not true. And how um, do we know that? There are multiple ways we can look at this. First, okay, before I get into the different bits of evidence, it's important to think about who the old Lithuanians and Russians and Latvians are as a people mm. relative to how the Vikings in the Nordic countries were as a people. And just you can see the cultural difference straight away. So the people of the Baltics, they were very much a hidden away, isolated group. Of course, they had interactions. Sorry about the kookaburras you hear in the background. Uh, of course, they had interactions with other tribes and other mm. peoples and they had a flourishing amber trade for example yeah but they weren't seafarers they didn't spend much time on uh, going up and down river systems they were very much people who adapted to a densely wooded forested environment and you can see that in their methods of warfare they were fast moving lightly mm -hmm. armored very much archers and spearmen even right through to the middle ages they were famous for their lights horsemen they weren't uh famous you know naval seafaring warriors right they weren't carrying heavy shields and axes uh, they had a very different way of being light on their feet mm. guerrilla tactics that sort of thing whereas the vikings we all know long boats uh, axes shield walls yeah and they were the roost that colonized all up and down the river systems mm. in what is now modern day russia so those initial raids on Byzantium in the 8th and 9th century, mm. where the Rus had colonized uh, Novgorod and Kiev, well, they were sailing down the river systems and they attacked down river systems. So, so to say, uh, were any of them Lithuanians or Prussians? I'm sure many of them were. I'm sure that from the perspective of the Byzantines, mm. uh, being a Northman, well, Lithuanian and Prussians were definitely, f from their point of view, in Northern Europe. Yeah. Uh, and also there, there would have been some native peoples in the areas that the Vikings colonized uh, and then the Rurikid dynasties ruled over. That said, linguistically, it's clear that these were Scandinavian languages. The origins of Russian uh, has much more in common with the Nordic countries than it's certainly Latvian or, or Lithuanian. Mm. And then when the uh, Kievan Rus converted to Orthodox Christianity, as part of the deal, Vladimir of Kiev sent 6,000 of his personal bodyguard to defend the emperor uh, of Constantinople, who then formed the Varangian Guard. Now, it's all in the name Varangian. Varangian meaning the Viking Northmen. So the, the Rus saw themselves as Viking. Yeah. They spoke languages that were Viking. Their cultural tactics and things were all viking you know long boats and shields and all of that and their pagan religion tended to follow the nordic gods so for all of those reasons we can be pretty confident that the origins of the rus are viking that said the russians quickly adopted a slavic identity and culture and this is where a lot of the confusion about are the russian slavs 
Well, they certainly call themselves Slavs, as do the Ukrainians. And they say, you know, we're fellow Slavs mm. uh, and that the Slavic identity is kind of pan-Eastern European. Yeah. But that was something that was adopted once they had colonized those areas. So biologically, they're genetically, they're from Scandinavia. But culturally, ethnically, they are Slavic. And so there is complexity there. Now, of course, Lithuania, Latvia, Prussia, they're part of this region. They had all this cultural interplay over many centuries. They influenced the Rus and vice versa, but they're their own people. So where does the like ancestry of the Lithuanians sit in all of this? That's a, that's a fantastic question. So one of the unique things about Lithuania uh, and Latvia and others, but particularly Lithuania, is that it's the oldest language in Europe uh, that's still spoken today, predating Latin by thousands of years. Lithuanian is extremely archaic, has a lot of similarities with old Sanskrit, mm. and indeed some scholars even think it originates from ancient Hittite. So in what is modern day Turkey, there was an empire in the ancient world in the Bronze Age yeah. called the Hittite Empire. And their language, which is written in cuneiform, has a lot of similarities with modern-day Lithuanian. So at some stage, there was a migration out of the Middle East, out of ancient Mesopotamia, mm. thousands of years ago, because, of course, Lithuanians biologically are quite Caucasian, quite pale, they have blue eyes. So they've obviously adapted to the local environment mm. over a long period of time. Interestingly, the tribes of the Aesti, the Baltic tribes as they were known to the Romans because mm. they bought their amber from, from up there, they thought that they were actually uh, had Roman ties and that mm. during the Middle Ages, the Lithuanians thought that 500 uh, people from Roman families who had been expelled by Nero had drifted northward and founded Vilnius and, and Lithuania. Now, of course, we know that to be untrue. The Lithuanians had their own origin myths about the city of Vilnius. Mm. Very pagan. The pagan religions of, of Lithuania have a lot of similarities with the Nordic countries. Of course, Perkinus and Divas. All of those can be seen to be aspects of you know, Thor and Odin. So there's a lot of similarity culturally mm -hmm. between the Lithuanians and the Scandinavians. Yeah. But Linguistically, it's much older from ancient Mesopotamia region. And yet biologically, it'd be a, a mix of, of different groups, although quite isolated because of the Baltic forest, the dense Baltic forest, yeah. which protected them from various invasions. So if you think about uh, Genghis Khan, uh, Attila before him, well, none of these massive hordes that came off the steppe lands could get deep into the Baltic forest it wasn't conducive to the open plains of uh, mm. horseback archery that they were so familiar with. Whereas uh, these migrations that came through what is now Hungary and Austria, uh, that were all coming from the steppe lands. They had all these influences. Whereas the Baltic region remained isolated for many, many hundreds of years, reflected by the fact that they were the last group in Europe to be Christianized. Mm. Mm. Uh, it wasn't until the Northern Crusades with the Livonian Brothers of the Sword and the Teutonic Order um, that this sort of got underway in earnest. So the old Prussians, the Lithuanians, the, the Latvians, they've got the uh, various different tribes, the Koronians, the Letgalians, the Semigalians. Mm. These are all ancient peoples yeah. and their language comes from a different part of the world but has evolved locally in that area. As I say, genetically, a lot of interplay with the Nordic countries. Yeah. But the Rus, as we know them, yeah. who are the modern-day Russians, well, they were um, genetically Scandinavian, but culturally Slavic. So yeah. very complicated, basically. It is really complicated. <laughs> I'm just like, I follow along. I think I just have to replay this in my head to, to understand. But... Oh. It's very hard to follow. And, I, like, and I'm constantly learning as well. And no doubt there'll be people who... Uh, in the comment section below who will let me know various different things that I wouldn't know otherwise. You know, uh, I've never understood, right? So this whole war with Ukraine is on the basis that Russia believes that Ukraine was always Russian. Because Russia has always like occupied different countries. Like why does why is Ukraine so special? 
in this circumstance. They say it's the exception. Okay. It's hard to find two cultures as similar as Ukrainians and Russians. Maybe Australia and New Zealand. That's about about it. Okay. Right. The Orthodox Christianity, which some 80% of Russians will define what it means to be Russian mm. as religion. Even though there aren't that many people going to church, they, they still see it that way, culturally. Well, Orthodox Christianity in Russia came from Ukraine, mm. Kiev. Uh, the Rurikid dynasties, uh, they ruled over cities that stretched from Novgorod, Moscow, Kiev. And linguistically, there are many Russian speakers in Ukraine. Mm. Ukrainian itself is uh, an offshoot, a uh, very similar language, of course, to, to Russian. Uh, so similar language, similar history, similar uh, people in terms of uh, their ethnicity and, and genes and their family tree. Uh, many people have family in both countries. Mm. So it is extremely similar. So it's understandable that the Russians see many Ukrainians as their Slavic kin and vice versa. The question is whether or not that justifies a military invasion to absorb it. Uh, mm. And of course, Ukraine is a recognized country internationally. A it's a sovereign nation. It's a sovereign nation. It has the right oh. to determine its own future. Mm. The Russians are claiming that it's the expansion of NATO to the Russian border and the threat this poses to Russia. The idea that Ukraine, after Ooh. the cultural revolutions, yeah. um, uh, the color revolutions, I should say, kind of uh, there's a strong feeling about maybe becoming part of the West, joining the Euro European Union. Joining NATO? Potentially, but the only reason NATO has expanded is at the wishes of the countries that have joined, right? Mm. It's not like the US has gone, you must join NATO. What's happened is those countries have applied. Mm. And if countries like Ukraine that share so much culture and history with the Russian people, if they are considering NATO membership, well, yeah. the real question the Russians should be asking is, why are they so threatening to their neighbors mm. that even those that are so similar to them would contemplate NATO membership? Yeah. Uh, but of course, there was no appetite for Ukraine to join NATO. I don't think that there was any prospect mm. of Ukraine joining NATO in the foreseeable future because joining NATO puts enormous burdens on the other NATO countries because mm. they, an attack on one is an attack on all. Right. The NATO charter applies to everybody. That means that if Russia invades Estonia, 150 kilometers from St. Petersburg, yeah. the Spanish and the Portuguese have to die for Estonia. That's what the NATO charter says, right? Yeah. I don't know whether I want to sign up for that. <laughs> well, nobody wanted Ukraine to sign up for that. I mean, very little appetite in Western Europe mm. for that to occur. And you know, when I saw the speech by Vladimir Putin mm. announcing the recognition of Donbass and Luhansk, it was an hour-long speech, and in it he laid down, first of all, he didn't see Ukraine as a country, which is just mm. objectively false, but also his ambition became clear. Although he criticised NATO, what Putin really wants is the restoration of the Russian Empire, mm. as it was during the era of Peter the Great, Catherine the Great. That's how he sees himself, that's how he sees the, the legacy, and having Ukraine as too independent of Russia mm. is not conducive to that ambition. So right. he is really empire building. This is straight up an expansion. And because Ukraine isn't part of NATO, it's the low hanging fruit. Mm. Do you think he'll be successful in the invasion? Because he could, he could invade, but to actually sustain you know, control of Ukraine might be a different story. Like. It's a great question. Should I answer no? Uh, like, as we're recording this, there is street by street fighting in Kiev. Thousands yeah. upon thousands of people have already died in the first few days of fighting. Even if Putin captures Kiev mm. and secures all the territory east of the Dnieper River, the rest of that territory 
I mean, the, the capital of Ukraine will just move to Lviv, which is beyond the reach of Russian conquest, I think, because mm. that would prompt foreign intervention. Yeah. Whatever's left of Ukraine will certainly join NATO or the EU, become an ally of the West. And even if the capital falls, the Americans have said publicly that they will train up an insurgency outside of the country, arm and equip them, and send them in there to fight Russia. So this is going to be a Russian also mm. for as long as they're there. And that's assuming they're successful. Mm. I don't think it's an, at all assured that Russia is going to be able to secure the capital because they've suffered enormous losses in terms of their uh, armor, uh, two full troop carrying aircraft filled with paratroopers were shot down just today mm. over 200 russian soldiers just like that uh, so the the bloodbath is enormous and the more that the ukrainians can hold out the more the international community will galvanize to support them yeah. uh, the kind of military forces that are going in uh, in terms of weapons and supplies ammunition are really useful for urban combat. And I don't think the Russians are really ready for it. So even now, that's not to say that, you know, this is a done deal. Russia's military preponderance is huge. They've got a massive advantages. But securing a country of 40 million people that is bitterly opposed to their occupation, extremely difficult. And the morale among the Russian troops is surprisingly low. Uh, first of all, they weren't sure why they were there <laughs> on yeah, the border. <laughs> they, they, they didn't know they were about to invade until it happened, a lot of them. And they were told that they'd be greeted as liberators. Where have we heard that before? Uh, oh. And yet they're facing stiff opposition for people that are yelling at them in Russian to get the hell away. Yeah. So it's not, not at all conducive to any of that. Like, I, I don't see how Russia comes out of this with this stunning victory. Mm. Uh, the, the losses in Russia are racking up. Even within Russia itself, the mass protests against the war, yeah. uh, Putin doesn't have the support of the populace. There was even a, uh, today, and uh, maybe I'll get the footage, uh, a Russian tennis player who won his second set in an international tennis match. Yeah. He went up to the camera and wrote no war on the lens, oh, broadcast wow. to the world. I mean, the, the, even within Russia, it's not clear that there mm -hmm. is an appetite to go and shoot the Slavs. And one of the reasons Zelensky, who is in Kiev right now defending his country valiantly on the front lines with his soldiers, mm. well, even Zelensky, the reason he was so slow to react, so slow to mobilize, was because he just could not believe that Russia would shoot their fellow Slavs. Yeah. And, you know, he, he resisted the, the information that the Americans were providing him because he thought, no, Russia's not going to do that. That's not who they are. Uh, and yet it has happened. And one has to have some sympathy with Zelensky, although people can be critical of his you know, unpreparedness. It's not hard to imagine that it'd be, it's difficult to believe. It is such a tragedy. It's hard to believe that this would happen. You know, Putin has gone off the deep end with this. Yeah. And there was, I don't know if it was just the media, but or was it in Putin's speech that said that, you know, the reason that he came in was to liberate and, like, there was Russian genocide happening in Ukraine and all these things. Like... Yeah, he did post a, an announcement kind of saying that he wants peace. Yeah, it wants to be peace, but then it's like, yes, peace with violence. So I'm like, that, they're two different things. Like, my definition of peace is very different to Putin's definition of peace. Like, <laughs> Yeah, he said things are just plainly untrue. I mean, oh. first of all, he said there was no annexation of Crimea. This was all just a the vote of the Crimean people themselves. Let's be clear, this wasn't a referendum that happened under international auspices mm. with foreign observers run according to best practice. This was a vote done unilaterally by the Russians. And when they it was declared carried, uh, Russia then invaded, right? Mm. Then he's saying he defended the uh, country of Donbass, which he has recognized as part of Russia. Well, he recognized it 24 hours before invading mm. with hundreds of thousands of troops amassing for months along the border. So this is all just pretext. And the one thing I can say that's positive for the United States and Biden, and I've been, no one is more critical of Biden than me, but 
one thing that he has done right is control the narrative. Uh, mm. The Brits and the Americans published their intelligence from what they were seeing on the ground, the communications between different leaders in Russia in real time. Mm. It meant that Russia couldn't create this false narrative of like Ukrainian aggression and Russia just defending itself. Yeah. These false flag operations were all being called out before they even yeah. happened. So Putin has played his hand. He's had to go in and invade and he looks like the aggressor that he is. Yeah. Thanks in large part to the, to the control of the media narrative that the yeah. West has managed to have. So the whole world is on Ukraine's side, except mm. for China. Belarus. And Belarus. <laughs> uh, but as we speak, the borders of Poland, Slovakia, Moldova, yeah. Romania, they've all been thrown open to any Ukrainian fleeing the, fleeing the crisis. Mm. So uh, enormous sympathy for Ukraine. And I think a lot of... Uh, solidarity and russia are they going to be able to, to to succeed i doubt it yeah and i just want to know what the long-term effects would even be you know like if you so say okay say russia did like you know be able to capture ukraine and was successful in that you know what what would that even really mean to russian people like does that mean more, you know, more expansionism and then hence if they do lose <laughs> like what does that do to the, the relations between ukraine and russia if like, Russia loses, Putin is finished. Mm. Uh, that That's 100% clear. If Russia succeeds, the fallout will be as follows. First of all, Russia has broken the Great War taboo. After all, the wars we're used to are like the United States going to some... Middle Eastern country. Undeveloped area, <laughs> with, filled with lawlessness and making the rubble out there bounce for a bit, right? Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the five years that there was combat operations in Iraq, the US lost about 4,500 soldiers. Russia, not mentioning the Ukrainians, for which the numbers will be eye-watering, but Russia, just in the first three days, has, has hit that number, right? Oh, my gosh. That's what real interstate warfare is like. Mm. Utter carnage two different sides tearing each other apart. And so Putin has, purely by choice, through a war of aggression, broken that taboo. Yeah. It is, he has made interstate conflict a thing again, okay? That means that Taiwan and China mm. becomes into focus. Of course. China has backed in Russia and supported it through this crisis. So that alliance between Russia and China is now entrenched. It's absolutely part of the fixture of geopolitics. Mm. And therefore, when Russia moves into Ukraine, China is gonna be more aggressive in Asia. When China's more aggressive in Asia, Russia will be more aggressive in Europe, throwing America off balance, who can't be everywhere at once, mm. okay? So the conflict over Taiwan is definitely gonna happen. And the United States will definitely be engaged. So the, the conflict over uh, Ukraine is prologue. We are now in the post post Cold War phase. We're in the new geopolitical competition phase of world history, mm. and the major conflicts that will unfold this century are yet to come. Right. Then, if Russia is successful in Ukraine, we've got Kaliningrad, the the Russian exclave next to Poland. You've got Ukraine, you've got Belarus. Belarus, I think, will just be annexed by Russia. I don't think Belarus is going to remain independent at all. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then Russia. You've got the Baltic countries, which... You think about how big Ukraine is. Ukraine is the second biggest country in Europe by landmass. It's huge, mm. enormous, right? Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia are a few hundred kilometers wide on completely flat territory with yeah. the Baltic Sea at the back, right? So Russia moving into Ukraine, mm -hmm. one big step, but then moving into NATO, entirely possible. Yeah. So Finland and Sweden are going to be thinking about their security right now. Mm -hmm. They may well join NATO as a consequence of this. Russia has already threatened Finland. If they join NATO, that there'll be military response. So general war in Europe, could definitely be a thing, particularly once China moves into Taiwan. Right. That will be World War Three. America will declare war on China. There'll be a massive war in the Pacific. Ooh. Russia will move into the Eastern Europe. There'll be massive general war in Europe. 
and uh, that will be that's that's the, the the history of things to come. It's bleak, but I think yeah, <laughs> inevitable. Oh, let's just... unless Russia suffers a humiliating defeat. Humiliating, uh, as in like describe it to me. Uh, that the Ukrainians managed to either hold Kiev yeah. or retake Kiev mm -hmm. uh, if they lose it. That Russia, its economy just buckles Isn't under it the weight tanking? of sanctions. It's tanking enormously, but uh, that it that it just falters to the point where there's general collapse. I there needs to be a revolution in Russia. If Ukraine holds out against Russia mm. and it turns into a bloody quagmire. Well, that means several things. Russia's economy collapses. The thousands of Russian casualties that we're experiencing right now turn into hundreds of thousands. Mm. So every family in Russia gets touched by this conflict. Yeah. Then the global sympathies being with Ukraine and the fact that Putin is not delivering any of his promises or his vision, there's likely to be a revolution in Russia. If that happens, then Russia itself could turn into a pro-Western country, right? Oh, they, wow. they, could, they could just de get rid of the FSB, get rid of Putin and the oligarchs, and you get a new leadership in Russia that are like, screw this, we're really sorry about Ukraine, and you know what, we're going to be part of the West, and we're not going to be dependent on China. That could change things. That could actually break that alignment between China and, and Russia. Mm. China will go to great lengths to prevent that from yeah, happening. Yeah, I was going to say, China will do everything in their power. But yeah. that's the best case scenario. Okay. Uh, and all of it rests on Ukraine holding out. Mm, all right. So I guess it's more like watch this space and see what happens. Um, yeah, hopefully I'll have some more videos even before this is published. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is, it's a terrible, terrible crisis. I mean, it is. The, 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 that I, blows my mind, right? I'm so young, whatever, you can say it. But like, I don't really get to experience what war looks like until like now, <laughs> what it really means. <laughs> um, Almost no one alive today has. I mean, your experience is not, not unique. Oh, okay. After the Second World War, there was the Cold War yeah. between the Soviet Union and the United States. And there were a few conflicts along the way, Afghanistan, Vietnam, mm -mm. Korea, but Broadly speaking, it has been a time of extraordinary peace and incalculable upness of human well-being across the board. So Poverty, infant that? mortality, <laughs> all of that just, just vanishing uh, because of power. Yeah. That's oh. not what human nature is. Human nature seeks to dominate and expand and, mm. and rule. Uh, and ambition and fear and interest yeah. and status uh, these things are what weight make wars and I guess if you're like you know impoverished nation you haven't got much to lose like that's why North Korea always threatens to bomb the world because then they're so poor <laughs> right like well it's part of it I mean definitely in North Korea's case that's that's completely true Russia sees itself as a great nation since the end of the Cold War, they haven't really contributed much to the global system. And so they know that they're in decline, they can feel it. And this is a restoration that they're seeking. Mm. And, and Russia's just an interesting case because I don't hate Russia. Uh, Russia has given humanity so much. If we think of uh, everything from Tchaikovsky mm. to Rachmaninoff, Lermontov to Akmatova, culturally, spiritually, Russia has done enormously. Mm. And it played a pivotal role at, with unbelievable sacrifice mm. at defeating the Nazis. Mm. But politically, Russia has always been a tale of sorrow. I mean, from the Rurikids to the Romanovs, from Stalin to Putin, the Russian people have never had it terribly good to the point where they actually believe they need these tyrannical leaders in order to keep everything going, mm. uh, such as the pathos. 
um, but the Russian governments have never done much for the world. And, and that's not because the Russian people don't deserve better. They do. Uh, and they could do better. But they've got this mentality, having for countless centuries mm. lived essentially as serfs. And so they're used to being treated as yeah, less than less than individuals, just part of a, a great state. Right. Hmm. Interesting. You talk about human nature and glory and power. Like, like, I'm sure there's other things that can like fulfill the Russian soul rather than you know it's expansionism. But like again, I guess it's more Putin's agenda than anything else, right? That's what his legacy. Well, that's what he's decided to be his legacy. Um, yeah, and it's on his shoulders, uh, certainly. Mm. And that's why if it doesn't go well, mm. he will wear the, the cost of that. Because yeah. it's, not, it's not a shared burden in Russia. It's, it's on Putin himself. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Uh, so we recently, uh, for this month, reviewed The Jump. Yeah, go watch it. It's a great film. Yeah, the documentary uh, following Simon Kuderka's journey. Uh, leaving, or I was leaving the Soviet ship, but is that? Yes, uh, but then eventually he gets sent back. He gets sent back, and yeah. Stuck in the school like exactly all that stuff. But one thing at the end, right? We talked about you know all the different uh, scenes, and at, at the end, um, Seamus decides to leave the US and go back to Lithuania. It wasn't really touched on why he chose to do that. He seems to appreciate the US as it is, but then there seems some sort of I guess, disillusionment towards the US. Exactly. And it's it's quite subtle in the film. They do touch on that journey. Mm. Uh, there is a sense earlier on in the film that when he's younger, he's being interviewed, he's amazed at what Americans are just willing to throw away. Yeah. Or he walks into like Walmart and he's like, oh, you have so many different products on the shelf. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so he sees America as this land of abundance and opportunity mm. and hope and prosperity, but also ultimately sees some problems. Mm. And one of the uh, commenters, Amber, uh, she left a really thoughtful uh, series of remarks about the film on the channel. And it got us thinking about what are American values and why would someone like Seamus Goderka mm potentially grow disillusioned to the point of wanting to leave, okay? Mm. He clearly appreciates America, He right through to the end of the film. But there are things that disappointed him. One, uh, the fact that Americans seem to be so wasteful, at least in his mind. Yeah. Also, he couldn't help anybody else. Yeah. He started to realize that he got out because of his celebrity. And the power of celebrity, the power of attention, it seemed, I think, for him a bit superficial that people wanted to do something for him because it pulled on the heartstrings. He was an individual. Mm. They knew his story. Yeah. Then they realized he's American. <laughs> All of that. But then there are so many other people trapped behind the Iron Curtain in gulags, political prisoners. Yeah. And it wasn't that people cared so much about that system. Mm. They just cared about him and his celebrity status. Mm. So he was kind of disillusioned by that. And also the fact that, and we talked about this in the actual review, as a celebrity, he's not like a movie star or a tennis player or a politician. His celebrity is not tied to what he does day to day. He was living a very ordinary life in the United States. It wasn't like he was making films by day and then by night was, you know, doing interviews and making yeah. lots of money. He was working as a, a building attendant, right? So he would go on speaking tours and would get all the adulation, but then his normal life was completely separate from that. So he could see celebrity as kind of what, what it is, a bit of an artifice. Yeah. And he was never able to use his celebrity to help others. So that, mm. I think, really hurt him. I think he saw America as a bit of a facade, that you've got this light on the hill, but the way he put it, when you get close to the palm trees, the palm trees have prickles and you have to look after them and they they grow funny. When you look at America up close, you see all of its problems. Mm. And 
he's talking about you know drug use at the time he had an interview in the 80s and 70s where there was a massive spike in drug use uh the obviously poverty in america has shot up the distance between rich and poor yeah and this celebrity obsession of yeah. america or even when he like looked at it, like watched a film of himself a remake of his story and it was like it's a good film but very americanized <laughs> Yes, very good pickup. Yeah, so I think that's what makes sort of Eastern Europeans potentially a bit disillusioned. Uh, I think right now one of the things that's upsetting people is the the most pro individual rights, freedom of speech countries mm. are in Eastern Europe. So the Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, mm. Poland is big on this. And they had seen America as this country with the founding fathers, and Amber touches on this as well, yeah. the founding fathers where they've enshrined in their constitution inalienable rights, freedom of speech and association, right to bear arms, so protection from a tyrannical government, mm. no forced religion. These things are truly American ideas. And yet what we have is increasing authoritarianism in the United States, yeah. you know, increasing censorship, increasing government overreach, all these mandates and restrictions. Mm. So people in the Eastern Europe who had previously looked at the US as this beacon of hope, mm. certainly did through all the decades of occupation during the Cold War, mm. and now looking at these countries and being like, do these countries even stand for their own beliefs? Now, while that's not really touched on in the Jump movie, I do see this as something that other Eastern Europeans talk about quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so it's possible. I mean, do they? I mean, oh, you, yeah. you know, like how, you know, Americans have the idea, like everyone has like the ideal, right? Of who they want to be, what kind of values they stand mm. up for. But then I think we did touch on the we. We often fall short. We're, we're, we're there, we fall short. <laughs> yes. And this is, I've spent a lot of time in both Russia and the United States. In fact, I've flown directly between them multiple times. The Americans, deep down in the pit of their soul, it's part of who they are, they believe that everyone on Earth is secretly an American. That if you just give everyone the right freedoms, institutions, democracy, you too will be an American. <laughs> yeah. Now, on balance, that's one of their strengths. It has led to some enormous mistakes. Mm. The Iraq War, they thought they were going to be celebrated as liberators and that Iraq would become a beacon of democracy in the Middle East. Huge mistakes mm. that America makes because of this. But still, on balance, it's one of their strengths. Why? Because it makes them a restrained superpower. When, when they do something, they... They're doing it knowing that the people they're affecting are potentially latent Americans, that there are ordinary people that just could actualize as Americans. Mm. They, in other words, they have a universal ideal mm. that everyone can participate in the American dream, even if you're not American. Right. The Russians know that is complete nonsense, that their people have different mentalities, different worldviews, different backgrounds, mm. and different uh, values and the Russians for, on balance is one of their strengths it's one of the reasons they just that they're not interested in abstractions they talk practicalities they don't have these ideals they talk power politics yeah. and it has led to their own tragedies which we see right now playing out in Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, but overall the American ideal is a good one it, it puts the individual at the center it says that everybody has inherent worth as a human being uh, and just look at the results who, who do most countries want to be like do they want to be like russia or do they want to be like the united states much to the consternation of russia mm. um, so yeah it's, it's on american ideals are good america is a great country it's great people but they appear hypocritical because they do fall well short of that ideal there's still injustice this, you know, the, the cost of healthcare in America is insane. The, the student debts are amazing. Yeah. The poverty, the crime, the incarceration, uh, all of these are serious problems. Uh, mm. The drug use, the, the gun running, mm. uh, the gang warfare, all of this is amazing. Yeah, and then all those reasons is like, 
what I hear from China as ammunition to be, don't be like America. Yeah, that's right. But here's, here's a great thing. If people complain about criminals getting back on the streets in America with slaps on the wrist and stuff like that, well, China has a 99.9% .9 conviction rate. It's a bit like elections. If you win an election with 65% of the vote, you're incredibly popular. You've won with a landslide. If you win with 100% of the vote, you're a dictator. Yeah. And if you think of China's judicial system, its social credit system, mm. everything that you do is monitored and tracked from the moment you're born to the moment you die. It's all in service to the Communist Party. Yeah. And the Uyghurs, oh my gosh. The Uyghurs, the people of Hong Kong, no. uh, people of Tibet. Uh, it's just is a nightmare, a nightmare from which there is no waking. So mm. I think for Europeans, China is a bit distant. You could tell a lot about a, what a country's consciousness is by its bookstores. So, for example, during the global financial crisis, I would go to Scottish bookstores and it'd be like banking ruiners and and stock market scams and all of that would line the bookshelves. Right. But nothing on China. Like, just just vanished. But Australia, which didn't get affected nearly as badly by the GSC, didn't even go into a recession. Well, it would be like, books in this bookstore would be, you know, the various uh, forms of Mandarin texts or uh, who's up and coming in the Politburo or, you know, the different dialects of Shenzhen province, you know, they very specific things about China. So the consciousness about China in Australia and Asia is every day. If you're in Singapore, China is omnipresent in your day to day thinking. Mm. Understanding China becomes a priority. Whereas in Europe, people kind of recognize China as this big bad empire, but it seems so distant that they don't fully appreciate the magnitude of China's strength. China is more powerful mm. than the Soviet Union ever was. Uh, when Bush went into Iraq in 2003, the American economy was eight times larger than China's. China's economy is now overtaking the United States mm. and it's just gonna keep going because it's got five times the population. So China is a terrible communist dictatorship and the global challenge to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Europeans, they're, they're not quite aware well, of it. Why, though? You think about it. If you're in Eastern Europe, the first thing you see is Russia because all the Soviet occupation, all that kind of stuff, right? That's the first one of mine. Then China is Australia's problem <laughs> and the US's problem <laughs> because I guess, you know, the world is round, so <laughs> it's proximity wise, it's closer. That's exactly true. Oh, yeah. like, it so seems that way. It does seem that way. But yeah. when, when China rules the world, it won't feel that way. No. Yeah. Uh, Ah, okay. Is there anything else I need to touch on? No. Uh, we have started booking things for the trip. So yes. it's actually happening. Oh my goodness. Hopefully. I just, I, you have to understand, we've been on Prison Island for two years. So this overseas trip, we just, even though we've got all the things moving forward on it, every expectation. Yeah. Just the sense of nervousness is still there because all it is like I remember when I when we first took the flight it's like overseas I'm like Crispin are we doing something illegal? Yeah. <laughs> this feels really illegal right now. <laughs> like it's been so long. I just checked my passport. You know, I got to keep your boarding passes for funsies. Mm. Like the last time I took a trip, I think was March twenty third, twenty twenty. Yeah. Which is really unusual because I'm always one to travel at least once a year. So mm. yeah. Yeah, I was in Mauritius just before COVID hit. Yeah. Got bitten by a dog. Oh yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. oh, fun story. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. Any questions, any feedback, leave them down below. Uh, we'll get this up in due course. Otherwise, stay safe and... Ciao for now.